بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلاة السلام على رسول الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, Welcome everyone uh, We're just going to get started now Welcome to the Zakat Masterclass uh, by National Zakat Foundation We're going to have a uh, Inshallah you've got all uh, shuffling in and Inshallah What we'll do I'll, I'll, I'll give you a um, quick introduction uh, to our, our speaker as well as go over a few housekeeping rules um, So Inshallah we will progress through um, a series of uh, of discussion points and going over the uh, the essence of zakat as well as getting into some inshallah some uh, some good amount of uh, like specific topics uh, specifically and there might be several topics that interest each one of you and you might have many questions associated with them so what i what i what we need um, the audience members to do is to use the q and a feature in order to submit your questions um, and uh, any kind of responses you can use the chat as well but i won't be manage, manage, monitoring the chat for questions but if there is any kind of audience participation that our instructor Arj uh, Shakharj is going to kind of um, go over, you can use the chat feature to kind of respond and, and, and have any kind of interactions there. But questions specifically, I will be using the Q&A feature. So do submit the questions and we will try to get to those periodically as um, some of the questions might be associated with certain to topics within uh, the, that, that we touch. And I will try to, at the end of that topic, um, try and look into some of the questions that are related or relevant to those topics and feel those questions to uh, Sheikh Arich, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get those answered. And we'll try to also maybe perhaps uh, answer some of those questions online uh, because some of those might be readily available that uh, I'll be monitoring, inshallah. So with that, we'll just get started. So my name is Asif Siddiqui. I'm the head of community development here at National Zakat Foundation. And um, we have uh, our instructor today uh, for this uh, conducting the Zakat Masterclass is Sheikh Arj Anwar. I'll give you a quick introduction to him. Sheikh Arj Anwar, he holds a Bachelor of Islamic Sciences in Fiqh and Usul al Fiqh from uh, Al Medina International University. He's also completed degrees in computer science at the University of Waterloo and, uh, and, and degrees in education from the University of Toronto. He's renowned resource on Zakat, particularly contemporary Zakat matters like that are relevant to here in Canada. And he sits on the board of SP funds, the London Muslim Mosque, and serves as advisors to numerous charities and wealth management organizations. With that, inshallah, uh, we'll, we'll hand it over to uh, with uh, Sheikh Arij. So you can go ahead and uh, uh, proceed, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minna shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu rasulahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa mula. رب شرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يبقه قولي ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا ذبنا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بري welcome uh, to the uh, zakat workshop and um, a timely workshop given that we are in the last uh, days of Ramadan the last few blessed days of Ramadan we ask Allah to accept from us and to allow us to see many more Ramadans uh, and uh, Ramadan is usually a time where many people uh, discharge of the obligation of zakat so inshallah this will be a timely reminder for all uh, we'll get started by uh, introducing uh, the concept of zakat first and foremost uh, particularly uh, the recipients of zakat who are the people who are eligible to receive zakat uh, and this is uh, detailed in a surah a tawbah surah number nine ayah number 60 in which allah subhanahu says ba'da'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين والمساكين والعاملين عليها والعاملين عليها والمؤلفة قلوبهم وفي الرقاب والغارمين وفي سبيل الله وبن السبيل فريضة من الله والله عليم حكيم الصدقات which is the plural of sadaqah and in the plural form it is referring to a zakat are only meant for the following categories uh, Allah calls it fadilata min Allah it is a duty imposed by Allah Allah is all knowing and all wise the categories are easier uh, understood or easier to read in this format the uh, you know a table or a list format these are the recipients uh, the categories of recipients al-fuqara is the first the destitute, al masakin, the needy. Number two, al amilin alayha zakat workers. This is generally, uh, you know, someone who's appointed by a Muslim authority. 
al mu'allafati qulubuhum uh, from the word uh, ulfa right ulfa is the person has some you know um some sort of a inclination uh, so the idea here is that these are people who are inclined towards islam uh, and zakat uh, pushes them over the line uh, and and helps them you know whatever uh, whatever grudges they may hold the zakat given to them uh, helps alleviate or helps them move past those grudges ar riqab is the captives uh, back in the day this was people who were enslaved uh, today you can still use it for people who are in a captivity situation like in unjust imprisonment and whatnot al ghari mean the indebted there's quite a bit of detail about who are uh, the indebted that are eligible for zakat but generally speaking a person who has a debt uh, that is um you know uh, that that can be serviced in a uh, timely manner and that prevents them from uh, you know that prevents them from you know having a better economic outlook then then al ghari mean uh, they are uh, recipients of, or they are eligible the recipients of a zakat. Fisa back in the day was used uh, for specifically the scholar, the the um, the mujahideen, the warriors who would volunteer in the Muslim army. Today, there this is a matter of debate, and there's quite a spectrum of opinions of what constitutes fisa because obviously we are not going to be funding any volunteer uh, soldiers anywhere. Ibn Sabil is the stranded traveler. Uh, generally someone who is rich, unable to access their wealth in a different part of the world, that will be called Ibn As-Sabil. Literally the son of the path, meaning that they're, you know, they're on a journey and then unable to get back home. That's like the the, the, the journey becomes like their new home and now they're uh, temporarily poor. Generally speaking, this also doesn't really apply today. The thing that really is important is the first two categories. I, I gave you a big, quick, big picture overview of the uh, of the of the categories, but the really important ones are al fuqara and masakin, and that is the most primary recipients of zakat. And these two are, you know, the ones that Allah Subhanahu began the ayah with. And in that in that context and from that perspective, they are the most worthy recipients of al zakat. Al fuqara and masakin, they're both similar, and the differentiation between the two here is fakir is someone who has some means. Uh, they can uh, excuse me. The faith is someone who has n very little means. Zero to fifty percent of their daily needs are being met. That is a faqir. Uh, this is a person who cannot even survive on a daily -day basis. Miskin is someone who can meet up to a hundred percent of their needs. Fifty to hundred percent of the daily needs can be met, and that allows them to live day by day. But they're living just hand to mouth. Both of these are included in the recipients of the cat. And these are the foremost recipients of a zakat. Um, since this is a brief, uh, you know, summary, I, I'm going to keep it on I, on the items that are more pertinent here for us here, inshallah. So, uh, those were the categories. What about people who are not supposed to receive from a zakat? So, uh, the first of it and the most obvious of it is someone who is the opposite of faqir and miskin, the rich. Okay, uh, the rich and, and the only exception amongst the rich is a person who is amilin alayha. If they're wealthy outside and they're appointed by the Muslim ruler to work as a zakat uh, worker, then they are eligible to receive uh, zakat. Um, other than that, by and large, the person who is receiving zakat is someone who is not wealthy. Uh, that's the purpose of zakat. It is to alleviate poverty. It's to provide a helping hand to people who are struggling. It's not meant to be uh, giving more money to the rich. The rich get richer. No, that's not the purpose of zakat. As back, the Quran is very explicit about this. Uh, speaking about another category of wealth and how it's to be managed in, 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 in the Sharia, Allah says that wealth must not just be concentrated amongst the rich um, of uh, rich of you, meaning that it shouldn't just you know, circulate between the rich, the rich get richer and richer, while the poor still stay poorer and get poorer further. And this idea of a uh, uh, of zakat is it is a transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor, not the opposite direction. So that is a, an important, uh, you know, distinction and important uh, understand a part to understand how zakat is supposed to function. 
Uh, also, someone who's, a, who's capable of earning an income, someone who is uh, able to do so, but uh, because out of uh, perhaps uh, laziness or uh, just being a slacker, they're not, uh, you know, they're not earning and then they want zakat money to uh, uplift them. That is someone that would be disqualified. And this is done on a case by case basis. Of course, of course, people who have a legitimate reason that they can't earn an income because they have disabled or they're you know, unwell, circumstances don't allow, of course, they will be eligible for zakat. Uh, the disbelievers, the Prophet Ali said, uh, 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 when he was sending Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu to Yemen, he told Mu'ad that you are going to people who are from Ahlul Kitab, mostly Christian. And he said, the first thing you should do, do is tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, now if they accept that, tell them about Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mandated the five daily prayers. Then if they accept that and salah becomes something that they are habitually doing, the spiritual foundation for their Islam is now laid, then tell them about zakat. And what is, what is it that he tells these people about zakat? It is taken from their rich and given to their poor. Because he said, taken from their rich, i.e. the rich of the Muslims, and given to their poor, i.e. the poor of the Muslims, because of this particular wording and other evidences, of course, as well, the rule here is the disbeliever is ineligible to receive zakat al -mar. Of course, the disbeliever can get uh, sadaqah. We can give them from sadaqah. We can give them from philanthropy. We can give them even qurbani meat. All of this stuff is okay. Only zakat. Only a zakat is restricted. The only exception to this hard and fast rule is al muallafati qulubuhum those whose hearts are inclined towards Islam, they're close to Islam, maybe there's some grudges, maybe there is a history of animosity, and if they receive zakat money, that wipes that slate clean and allows them to enter Islam happily and gleefully. So that is the only exception, and it was made at the time of Rasulullah and historically over, you know, over some periods. Uh, but other than that, one exception, the hard and fast rule is, only Muslims are eligible to receive zakat al-mal and not anybody else. Zakat versus other forms of charity. Uh, the word for other forms of charity in uh, Arabic and the Sharia is sadaqa. And sadaqa is, uh, in fact, a broad concept. Kullu ma'roof in sadaqa. The Prophet Ali Sallallahu said sadaqa, charity, is anything that's good. Everything that's good is an act of charity. Meaning that you're not being, char you're not being charitable as in that this person is underprivileged and you are you know, supporting them. The idea is that's an act of worship, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or excuse me, um, the Prophet Wasallam even references uh, uh, the right? when you are intimate with your spouses, that's an act of charity. So the idea of charity in Islam is broad. It's an act of worship. Anything that pleases Allah, that brings uh, happiness to the people, uh, the, you smile in the face of your brother uh, that is an act of charity that is the broad concept of sadaqah in Islam to bring happiness to people to provide for people to be there for people to show and express your love to people particularly your spouse that all of that all ma'roof is sadaqah now there's also a, uh, a sadaqah that is philanthropy that's actually uh, money uh, that you give to help someone who is in need that is voluntary. That's the key thing about sadaqah. It is voluntary. It is completely something you do out of your own accord. It is not a obligation. It's not one of the pillars of as compared to zakat, which is an obligation. Uh, zakat has a very specific rate. As we will learn, it is 2.5% for gold, silver, and gold, silver like uh, instruments such as currencies and, uh, and, and liquid assets like stocks and whatnot. Uh, and it is 5% for uh, other categories like crops, 10% for crops that are naturally irrigated, but there's a prescribed rate. And even in the cattle, there's a prescribed rate. Every 25 camels, you give one uh, as zakat. Okay, very, very specific, very detailed. And all of this is mujma alayhi. There is no difference of opinion. There is unanimous consensus on the rates of zakat. The, every asset class, the specific amount that is to be given from it, 
it's com it there it, it's it, literally in writing. It was a letter from uh Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu that sent to all his governors that literally spells out for each asset class what is the zakat as agreed upon by the Sahaba. So that is as uh, ironclad as you can get. Uh, zakat is given by the Muslims to the Muslims. Charity or sadaqah. In our context, we are the Muslims. We're giving it, but it can be given to anyone. Uh, zakat. The recipients are very specific. Only those eight categories. Sadaqah. There is no restriction. You can give it to anybody you want. Uh, zakat is given once a year, uh, and it has to be given after the uh, money has been uh, saved for a year. The charity and sadaqah can be given whenever you want. Zakat is due on specific assets. Sadaqat is not due on any assets. You can get, give as you please. One other thing uh, I would like to add here is that zakat needs to have an intention. When you are giving zakatul mal, you must intend. You are intending. This is my zakat when you give it. Okay. Sadaqa has no intention. Okay. And this is an important distinction here. If you gave some money to someone, you retroactively cannot say, "Oh, that was actually my zakat." No, that will be sadaqa, inshallah. Zakat, you must intend it as you are giving it. Okay? That is because it is very specific and it is an obligation. All of the obligatory actions that we do, we have to have a clear intention for it. Whether you express the intention verbally or not, that's not the point. But you have to have a clear intention as you're starting that obligatory act. Because the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ right? You start with the niyyah and that determines the action. If you prayed four rakahs just randomly, that will not count as dhuhr. You have to intend without necessarily verbalizing, but your intention must be, your mind must be made up, I'm praying dhuhr right now. Okay? That uh, is a, in, a necessary requirement, a prerequisite for anything that's an obligation, and zakat similarly as well. Okay? Uh, we'll take one more slide here. Uh, zakat for services, and then we'll uh, see if there's some questions about this. The concept of zakat for services is zakat is given to the recipient. In the wal masakini wal Allah SWT says the zakat is given uh, to the needy, the destitute, etc. And then he uses the word li, the word that's used precisely the preposition that's used is li, and that li is in Arabic for a tamlik meaning that determines uh, possession. Right? There's many ways to express giving something to someone. Okay, But here in Allah SWT uses that word specifically highlighting that zakat is given uh, to someone and then it becomes their property. All right, That is a prerequisite of zakat. However, sometimes that is not feasible. Sometimes that is maybe a little... Uh, it may even be counterproductive. Uh, and in those circumstances, it is acceptable to give zakat to someone for some service that they are paying for in lieu of that service or paying for that service specifically uh, without it being something that they uh, take possession of first and then they pay themselves. An example of this is uh, if you give zakat to a, uh, this was something that happened in, in you know, there was a question I got that a lady in, in, you know, I think in Pakistan, uh, she specifically did not want zakat given to her uh, in her bank account. She did not want the money because she said, the moment this zakat lands in our account, my husband will take it and then he will spend it and I will have no way of spending it uh, for the things that we actually need, right? So this is a very difficult situation. May Allah help this lady and anybody who's in that similar situation. But that is a real situation. So she said, I would like you to give my zakat. Uh, I would like you to give uh, the zakat that you're giving me uh, to the school where my children go. So their education is covered for, is taken care of. Okay. So with the consent of the recipient, you can do so. But without the consent of the recipient, you must give it to them in their hand and they must possess it and they do with it as they please. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Uh, that is that. Let's see if there's some questions here that we can take. Yes, actually, um, let me, let me, there's actually one question that's actually somewhat relevant and stems from some, it's about agency and employing someone else on your behalf. So mm -hmm. let me read the question. I send Zakat money to someone for distribution, but that person distributed among some people who are not Zakat eligible. Am I responsible for that, for Zakat that was distributed incorrectly? Mm. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, and uh, the answer for that is 
uh, so the answer to that question is that you are responsible because uh, it is your zakat, right? If they are dispersing your zakat uh, and you have appointed them as a, Islamically, this would be called a wakil, right? A someone who is uh, taking on the obligation on your behalf. Uh, then they must act in accordance to the Sharia. If they're not acting in accordance to the Sharia, then uh, they are not doing the job. And uh, ipso facto, your obligation is not fulfilled either. So that is an uh, an important part, an important question. Uh, in this situation, uh, I think you have two options. Option number one is you enforce the uh, the correct distribution of zakat, and you can. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing that because you're the one who is financing this, so you can enforce it as well, uh, given that you would have leverage. Or number two, you just uh, you know find an alternative way to give zakat yourself because this is your personal obligation and you must fulfill it uh, and you will be answer answerable to it uh, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu Okay. Another question is, can I buy food items and give to the poor instead to poor people instead of giving cash to make sure zakat is utilized in a halal way? The answer to that will be, uh, it depends on the poor people. Uh, if they are accepting that, if they say, yes, this is actually the best course of action, we would prefer that you buy food for us, then yes. If they are, if they don't say that explicitly, and that is not known even from them, right? Like, you cannot assume this. You cannot assume the people are unable to make uh, good choices. This is, in fact, part of uh, the Sharia. As Allah Subhanahu speaks about uh, inheritance and any you know type of transfer of wealth, He says when you have seen a uh, level of financial uh, fiduciary responsibility, then give the person the wealth. And Imam Abu Hanifa, in fact, comments on this, and he says that uh, part of building that rushd, that fiduciary responsibility, is allowing the person agency over their money. You cannot keep money away from people uh, and say until they become uh, a, 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 to reach a certain point, only then we'll give them money. Part of it is to give them the money and they make mistakes inevitably like anybody will make mistakes and they learn from that process, right? So the idea here is tamlik and, and, uh, should be uh, is the default. Possession is the default. Uh, money should be given to the poor. They possess it. They learn how to utilize it and use it. Mistakes will be made and that is fine. We should not just assume that these people are, you know, at, at a suboptimal IQ level. That's not, that's a, that's a bad assumption. But if the poor person specifically says, I would like this as food, or I would like it that you pay this uh, service or pay for this bill, then it is acceptable. Allah Allah. Okay, so so we can't, there's no, we cannot prescribe it or have strings attached to Zakat. The, yes. uh, the recipient can prescribe and other methods in which they would prefer to receive zakat, and that would be that would be acceptable. But we that can would be absolutely yeah, exactly okay. Perfect, exactly. Well said. Uh, we cannot uh, stipulate that. Hey, here's your zakat, and I'm going to give it to you as food. No, no. You have as a, as the giver, we say here's the zakat. The receiver can say, actually, I would like it as either cash or something else. Mm. The the next question is about nisab, and you're you're kind of getting into it. So why don't why don't you go ahead and do this section, and then we'll we'll pause, uh, and then maybe ask if there are any other questions about nisab. We'll bunch them together, inshallah. Perfect. Thank you, Zakla. Okay, nisab. Nisab is uh, the um, the minimum threshold that zakat wealth uh, or a person's wealth needs to be before they are required to pay zakat. That's the floor, right? If you're below the floor, you don't pay zakat. If you're above the floor, then you pay zakat. Okay. Uh, important thing to realize about zakat. Uh, zakat is on the savings a person has. It is not on their income. It is what a person has saved. And what a person has saved, let's see if people know. How long has the person, should the person, the Muslim, how long do they need to have the money saved before zakat is due? What do you think, people? What is the answer to that? Let's to get some engagement here as well. I don't want to be... Uh, it to be a monologue. Yeah, you guys can use the chat and uh, yeah. chat feature and just uh, type in some yeah. answers. Uh, Sister Khadija says one year, uh, one excellent, mashallah, uh, one uh, Gregorian year or lunar year. They're almost the same length. Correct answer is the Hijri or the lunar year. The idea is a person's wealth has to be in their possession for a lunar year, and then. 
if it clears the nisab, if it is above the nisab value, only then zakat is due on it. If it was not in possession for a year, if it was below the nisab, then zakat is not due on it. Are you guys clear on this? This is an important idea for, for, for zakat. It is not on income. People could be earning a lot and spending a lot. And alhamdulillah, that's their life. Uh, it is on what they have saved. And it goes back again to the concept of Lest money remains, you know, concentrated with the with the rich people, right? It needs to move around. It needs to transfer between the rich to the poor. If it's being spent, it's already being transferred. If it's just being hoarded, that's when zakat comes and forcibly, you know, moves it from the rich to the poor. Now, nisab, the minimum threshold, is determined uh, to um, to be as follows, right? Where is that slide? Sorry, yes. The nisab, uh, the minimum threshold is uh, 85 grams of gold or 595 grams of silver. Now, let me uh, back, uh, t take a step back and uh, give you a explanation for why we have this. In reality, you know, we should, I think, maybe like going for simplify this because uh, the original intent of this was something else, okay? So back in the day, before you had uh, fiat currencies, what was the uh, the what was the currency, the universal currency that a person could use? Anybody know? Like you can go anywhere in the world, and this is what you can use as currency. Say pre-industrial revolution. Any ideas? Use it. It's, on, yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, the answer would be, I think maybe people are typing or people are not. Sorry. Uh, before, say, 200, year, 200 years ago, what is the uh, currency you would use globally, anywhere in the world? Sister Umaima, uh says gold. Excellent. And silver. Exactly. Dirham and dinar. Right? These two, gold and silver coins, you could take anywhere in the world and basically use them and the person will then value your gold and your silver as per, as they want. And of course, you could also barter. You could take a, a, a kilo of dates and get a kilo of barley or something, right? Like that, that was completely uh, acceptable and that was a normal practice. But currency-wise, the currency of the, of the world was gold and silver, dirham and dinar, right? And for the longest time, and uh, the Khalifa Ma'moon actually is the one who made it very uh, precise. He's the one who started to uh, make the 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 weights of the uh, dirhams and the dinars to be as close to, uh, as close as possible, uh, or as uniform as possible. Excuse me. So that was then because you had two major currencies. The nisab was determined to be for those two major currencies, gold and silver, and that was based upon uh, some precedents that's found in the Sunnah. Some precedents as found in the uh, statements of the Sahaba and whatnot. Okay, that is how it used to be, and roughly gold and silver were equal in value. Of course, gold was always more valuable, but uh, you know uh, they were roughly they were close uh, to, to each other in value. Uh, then many years later, or many centuries later, now we have a situation where uh, we do not value our assets in gold or silver. We value our assets uh, and we value our net worth in dollars, right, or in a currency, usually dollars, but in a particular currency, wherever the person is. Uh, and now the question is, how do we take the nisab, the bare minimum that's required from back in the day that was agreed upon and was the case for all these centuries, how do we now translate that to a modern dollar value? And uh, you have now also to add to the problem, the discrepancy between gold and silver is very large. It's a very large discrepancy. Look at that, 8,650 versus 710. That's, you know, uh, almost $8,000 difference there, right? That's a very significant difference. So the idea is, uh, that's the origin of this, uh, of this problem, right? Now, the bare minimum, let's take like a first principles approach to this. The nisab is supposed to be when... You have nisab, that means you are wealthy enough, you're rich enough for money to be transferred from your savings to the poor. Are you all with me? That's what nisab was supposed to dictate. Okay, and is dictating. If we take that principle and we say, well, $710 
is in fact not a nowhere near a determination of a person's uh status as a wealthy person if a person has 710 dollars saved over the course of a lunar year we would not classify them as a rich person okay we would probably say you are tight your situation is pretty tight okay but if a person has you know eight thousand six hundred fifty dollars that they have saved over the course of the year after all their expenditures are taken care of we would say yeah you are by the definition of possessing wealth by the definition of nisab you are a wealthy person and you will now transfer some of your wealth to the poor in the form of zakat so that's the uh the origin story of how nisab came about uh and in my recommendation uh we should take the nisab of gold even though uh you know the, the, the script here says silver nisab but gold is uh, perfectly acceptable and recommended and whatnot uh but again going back to uh, the the concept that gave birth to the two measures here right that concept is how do you determine if a person is rich, rich and wealthy and this was a determination that was made the grams figure and this was mujma alayhi the scholars by and large agreed upon this right or close to a consensus on this uh and if you ask today the gold nisab is the more accurate representation of a person's wealth let's see if there's any questions about this uh, about nisab itself yeah so there was um the, there is a couple questions uh, related to nisab uh one was had to do with like the periodicity like the period on which you kind of calculate so the question was i received a bonus one week before zakat calculation day should you include this bonus money now when i calculate zakat or include it next year uh, mm. Zakat calculation when one year has passed from the bonus money. Mm. Uh, it depends on how much the bonus is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but <laughs> jokes aside, uh, you have two options when you're paying Zakat. We, we can let's let's dive into that maybe right away. How do you track your year, the year on your wealth, right? How do you determine that? Uh, I think maybe that should be a slide uh, somewhere uh, added uh, later, uh, Asif. But uh, yeah, maybe we can just discuss that right now. How do you know a year has passed? Okay. Uh, I would uh, break this into two categories. Category number one is your regular checking account where money comes in and money goes out. Yes. I think all of us have some a, a, a regular checking accounts like that, right? And that's how our finances work. You know, all types of you know, hopefully all types of income comes in and some types of expenses go out. Um, and there's a lot of fluctuation. Money is coming, uh, you know, in and out, coming in, going out. That account, the best way to value or the best way to determine your zakat is you pick a date and you say, what is the value on Ramadan one in that account? And now that is the one that I will pay zakat on. Of course, you are actually paying a little bit more than your that's due, but it's safer, it's easier, it's simplified. Not too much of an overpay either, because uh, there is so much fluctuation in the balance. That's number one, right? Number two type of tracking is a large sum of money that came your way, a lump sum. Say someone got a bonus, mashallah. Someone sold a car. Someone sold a house. Something. That was a big sum that they acquired. For that, you can track that big sum uh, with a separate date. So say you uh, you got that money in your account <clears throat> April 6th, 2014. 2024, excuse me. Uh, you got it on April 6th, 2024. You look at the date, you say this is 27 Ramadan. Great. You write it down. 27 Ramadan, lump sum. And then the next time, 27 Ramadan comes around in the Hijri year 1446, I believe. You take that lump sum, whatever of it has remained with you, and you give zakat on that. That would be tracking the lump sum separately from your balance, your checking account that has fluctuations in balance. That is the recommended uh, course of, uh, of action that I would say. If a person was like, you know what, I don't care, I'm just going to combine the two and just pay zakat on it all once. Alhamdulillah, good for you, brother. Alhamdulillah, you have done a good job and you have uh, overpaid male likes that from you. But if you want to be precise, you can uh, keep the anniversary date for the checking account separate from your lump sum and each lump sum you can track it separately. This is, by the way, completely the norm back in the day. 
people would have crops. They would have a, a date for the crop for their zakat. They would have uh, a date for their zakat for their camel. They would have a date for their zakat for uh, you know stuff that they acquired because of trade. They had a trade that happened you know three four months later that the return came and then that would be tracked separately. So this was completely normal back in the day. Uh, and and today we feel maybe sometimes this might not be a good thing. You can track all your assets individually as you see fit. For us, the problem is there's so much fluctuation and so much uh, so much so much um, activity uh, that it's hard to track the daily account with that much precision. So that is uh, the answer. Inshallah. I hope that made sense. Okay, there, um, there, there. I know we're gonna get into specific questions on RESP, specific uh, topics on RESPs, the RSPs. But there are a couple mm. of questions here related to them because they actually have more to do with um, more general concepts. So let me go read read one of them. Uh, the first one: mm. If RESP is family plan for multiple children, is the sab calculated by dividing the total uh, on the children and seeing the amount per child equals the sab? Or the total mm. example four children 16k plan value is under nisab 4k per child is less than nisab or, or over nisab because 16k total so this is more like i, I think at the mm. general principle is like well you know if you're in charge of a bunch of people do you do yeah. you, especially with children do you aggregate that you know or do you look at it individually because you are they're not indiv they're not adults and in, in control of that well so like what's you know there's a general principle question there yeah that's that's a great question uh, you can go about it in uh, two ways it's a great question uh, sister dima right you could see that okay this resp wealth right now it's under the name of the children but really i'm the guardian of this wealth right you can think of it like that for yourself and then you say you know what the whole wealth i will uh, the 16k in the family resp plan i'm going to pay zakat on uh, whatever I contributed from it, not the amount that the government um, gave the grant on, because the grant, if you were to, if you were to liquidate it as RESP, the grant money, the government will take it back, right? So you take the um, the amount you has you have contributed, and that's the one you would say I will pay the cash on that. Okay, we'll come to more on the RESP in a little bit, yeah. but that's so, just the principle. So total or. or... So what, Sorry, like total word. for total for all the kids or or individually? Yeah, yeah. So, because so you can say I am the guardian of this wealth for the whole mm. for all my kids, right? That's option number one, right? Option number two is you can say no, uh, these kids of mine, uh, they are, you know, their zakat is like this is now their wealth, and I don't have anything to do with it. Okay, I have given this wealth to my kids. It's I am not going to touch it. I will not take it out. Okay. If you take that option, and again, these are all up to you, right? The, how you want to see it and how your intention is. If it's that a second scenario, then still as their guardian, you would pay zakat on behalf of each child. But now you would uh, divvy up that 16K over the four. I'm assuming you contributed equally to all four children, right? Uh, you can still get that figure like from your broker, right? Like how much is it for each child? Because uh, that's tracked by the broker. Uh, and then... Each child would pay zakat based on their nisab, right? Uh, of course, the child won't pay it. You would have to pay on their behalf. But then this, uh, the nisab becomes separate. So assume they all got 4K in this example of 16K. Then all of them will be below the gold nisab. And until they reach the gold nisab, uh, none of them will pay zakat. Once they reach the gold nisab, then you say, you are, uh, you know, your wealth has reached nisab. On your behalf, I will pay zakat until you are valid and you're able to you know, uh, pay zakat on your own. This, these are two options. Again, these are modern day vehicles, right? These are modern day vehicles that we uh, employ uh, to grow our wealth, right? And it, in all of these, it really comes down to what is your intention? How do you see it? Do you see this as I am the guardian of all of this wealth? Or do you see that, no, this is actually a transfer of wealth from me to my children. It's theirs now. Mm. And however you see it, you uh, act accordingly. Okay. So it's just in, uh, your intention and what if that wealth you really consider theirs and you're not touching, then it's like you treat it as if it's theirs. If it's like, right. well, you, you're using this government vehicle, uh, like uh, investment vehicle, but it's just considered the family wealth, then it's then mm. it's something that you were saying that you have ownership over kind of thing. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, yeah. There's a question on uh, on on the sob thing with with where that bonus thing where it comes just before etc. Mm. Uh, building on the same question, what if the current Hijri year 2025 some went below nisab? Do we pay mm. the 2024 zakat? Uh, so uh, if that 
so so sorry i i may have uh, misspoken or you may have misunderstood your nisab is still say 8.6k right it's 8.6k or 8600 whatever right and the nisab is over so it's not a nisab per uh, amount that you are uh you know tracking right per lump sum it's not like okay 16k it's it got its own 8000 nisab no 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 your entire wealth your entire net you know, worth that has to be above the nisab. Okay, when I said like you know that money should still be above the nisab, I meant that your entire net worth has to be above the, above the nisab when fourteen forty six hijri year rolls around. I hope that made sense, brother Ahmed. Not to say that if you're tracking lump sum separately, all of a sudden there's a separate nisab for it, and there's a separate nisab for your checking out. No, 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 that will be uh, I think cheating <laughs> or mis and misunderstanding, misinterpreting, uh, in interpreting the concept. The idea is you can track it separately, pay it separately, uh, but the nisab is one between all of your accounts. Wallahuala. Okay. Um, there was another question. Um, it, it's it's around RSPs, and we can delay it yeah. for RSPs if it, and come back to it, Matt, perhaps. But um, it's it's um, they, regarding RSPs, they they put as much as possible into the RSPs to ensure a future, mm -hmm. inshallah, as a result. Once the bills are paid and RSP contributions are made, we end up having to use a line of credit to pay for zakat. Uh, oh basically, 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 I think this is the the last line. Just kind of mm -hmm. it's a cash flow issue. So when you have a cash flow issue, this is a general thing, I think problem. Like when you have cash flow issue, like when you have mm -hmm. um, like you have assets, but whatever it is you can't just liquidate them and and pay them out like what and you have mm. a cash flow problem what do you do in that particular situation i guess uh this is a very uh i don't know i i have mixed feelings about this question <laughs> 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 because uh uh unlike bills our rsps i mean rsps have a deadline but rsps are not like a bill that's due every month right mm. uh so you can delay your RSP contribution to the point where you don't have to borrow money to uh, mm. have that cash flow problem, right? So that I, I actually don't agree with the premise of the question. Okay. Uh, perhaps you can even explore uh, giving zakat from your stocks, right? Like you can give stock as, uh, you know, as zakat. Uh, I'm not sure how much, how what kind of tax implications they will have for RSPs or even if it's possible to give RSP uh, part of RSP as a donation, right? Because you can give uh, stocks as donations to registered charities. Uh, but say, assume it's, that's not a possibility. Uh, I would actually just go back to the original premise and say, you don't need to contribute to your RSP monthly. You don't have to. You can. You have to do it by the end of uh, February of the year, of the next year, right? By the end of the year or by the February of the uh, next year. Um, and then... And, and, you can solve your cash flow issue in that way. Wallahu I, I don't think it's, you cannot, in the line of credit, I'm assuming is going to be an interest-bearing loan, right? Yeah, yeah. You cannot take an interest-bearing loan to pay your zakat. That doesn't make any sense. Right. Okay. Wallahu Okay. Yeah. Okay. Also, there's a the question about the kids' RESP. Should the kids reach puberty first? Right? So, mm. uh, maybe we can take that one, huh? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, uh, Kids reaching puberty is a Sharia thing, right? Like when they reach puberty, they become uh, mukallaf, right? Mukallaf is they're liable in the eyes of Allah for their actions, okay? Uh, by the way, for zakat, uh, you don't have to be mukallaf. You don't have to, be, excuse me, you don't have to be baligh to be held liable, right? Like this is one of the uh, stronger opinions in the Sharia that a child, it doesn't matter what their age is, zakat is still due on their wealth because wealth is, uh, it's wealth irrespective of what your age is right it's the matter is who pays on behalf of the child right and in the case of the child when they're young and don't have access to money the guardian whether that's the parent or that's a guardian of an orphan they would disperse as a cat so just clarifying this concept resp has nothing to do with puberty there's only there's a particular uh time uh age when a child can start accessing it they need you know admissions into a post-secondary institution um, there's many rules around it. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but the access to it is determined by a person's standing when it comes to where they are in their uh, educational career and also their age, the combination of the two. So that's a separate matter. When I said what I said about the RESP, 
and uh, viewing it as this is money that I'm a guardian of, or I am, uh, you know, this is my, this is wealth that I have allocated for my children, but it's not their wealth yet, right? Then you still treat it like your wealth. Or if you say this is my children's wealth, it's not mine anymore. You are still going to be paying zakat on their behalf until uh, you know they reach a point where they are able to do it themselves. Whether that is puberty, whether that it's you know they, when they get to university, that is something that can be determined. That is not a sharia uh, conversation. It's whenever they have the ability to do so, right? But the zakat is due on it, uh, and you as the guardian pay it until you feel your children are ready to take this mantle on from you. Mullahwad. Okay, I think we should, um, for sake of time, let's, uh, let's, yeah. Go, yeah, let's continue on and uh, and we'll okay. see. There are some other questions, but I think they're related to um, to the different areas that you'll touch upon, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, alhamdulillah. But, uh, I hope that made sense with the party. That's a great question, alhamdulillah. Okay, what is the cat paid on? Uh, I actually like this format where we stop and do questions because I think sometimes the questions get stale over the course of the over the course of presentation. Uh, yeah, so this is, I think this is good, right? Like you address it right away, alhamdulillah. And a person's mind is at ease. Um, what is zakat paid on? Uh, as you, uh, as we mentioned earlier, zakat is paid on very specific assets. In Arabic, they say "haqqun wajibun fi malin maqsus li ta'ifatin maqsusa." They say that this is a obligation that is only on a specific type of wealth given only to a specific type of people. This is what zakat is: very, very specific, very restricted. Uh, what are those things? Cash and cash-like assets. Anything that's liquid is considered cash like acid. Gold and silver. Those are the original uh, currencies, but also gold and silver when it comes to jewelry, uh, whether it's for investment or for adornment. And we'll come to that discussion in a bit here, inshallah. But gold and silver, uh, by default, zakat is due on that. Okay. Debt owed to you. Money others lent, money lent, excuse me, to others that will be repaid. Money you gave to somebody is still Islamically your money. Any money you give to somebody as a loan, Islamically is still your money. And the position that we are presenting here is, since it's your money, you continue to pay zakat on it. Uh, even if the debt, uh, the money is not in your hands, you've given it to someone as a loan. If you realize that the person you've given a loan to is a bum, they're not going to give you your money back, right? Uh, that happens then you can stop paying the zakat. If you are quite certain that that money, you will never see it, okay? Or highly probable that you are not going to get any of it back, then you can stop paying the zakat on it. But if you're quite sure that this person will give me money, uh, my, my loan back, then you uh, pay the zakat on that for the duration of it being lent out. Uh, shares and investments, of course, they are cash-like assets because they can be liquidated and, uh, and, and turned into cash. So they are similar to this here. Uh, a business inventory and other business assets. I think other business assets are a little bit uh, vague here, but uh, business inventory specifically is the items. Here is what is Zakat is due on business uh, for, for, for a business. It's the source materials, the materials you use to manufacture your products and the products that you manufacture. The value of that uh, the the uh, the total money that's been made from it, value of the inventory that's sitting, and the value of the inventory that's sold, the value of the source materials that's sitting, the value of the source material that was used to create the product and being sold. That whole amount is what a person will pay zakat on. They will not pay zakat, for example, on the building that they're uh, the warehouse where they store the stuff. They will not pay zakat if they're a baker on the furnace or the uh, you know, the counter. No, no, they will pay zakat on the source material and the products they produce, the value of it and the money that is made from it. Uh, so that is specifically what business inventory here. Properties for sale. So zakat is not due on properties by default. Okay, By default, zakat is not due on properties. You live in a house, no zakat. You rent a house to someone, no zakat. You have a house or you have land, you are not, you don't know what you're going to do with it, no zakat. Okay, uh, the idea here is zakat was given from a piece of the actual item. If you had 25 camels, you'll give one camel off as zakat. Okay, how can you give a piece of your property? You cannot give a brick, right, <laughs> from your house as zakat. Uh, when, when a property is a, like a business asset, it's like a business inventory, 
then and only then you treat it uh, as zakat eligible, but it's not because it's property. It's because it's business inventory. Okay. So I want that to be clear to the people here, inshallah. Okay. Uh, um, let's look at. Uh, yes. Yeah. So after you go through this, when you go through the um, the uh, mm. the different uh, asset stuff, mm. start with the investment shares because most of the questions in there are about that. So in if the... you yeah, if you jump to that one afterward, after you when you before you get into jewelry and anything like that, if you go to that, I think that'll be that'll be good because uh, a lot of the questions are related to investments, so to speak. So yeah, yeah that's coming up. That's the next oh. slide. So oh, let's okay. go through it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just let's okay, go through it step by step. Okay. Uh, here is the uh, criteria that's needed. Uh, here's what you need to meet uh, uh, the criteria that needs to be met uh, for zakat to be due on you. Number one, complete ownership of the wealth. If you don't have ownership of the wealth, the wealth is inaccessible, then there is no zakat on it. Wealth is free of haram income. It goes without saying. Haram income should not even, it's not even considered Islamically as income. It should be disposed right away. As the hadith of the Prophet goes, in Allah, tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyiban. <clears throat> Allah is pure and He only accepts that which is pure must meet the nisab. It must be above the bare minimum threshold. Uh, if it's below the minimum threshold, all of your assets together are below the minimum uh, threshold. No zakat. And the uh, lunar year has passed over that wealth. Mahala alayhi al You can retain that wealth for a year, a lunar year. Then and only then, zakat is due on your money. So this is, uh, if you have assets that are if you have cash, gold, silver, investments, business, you would take the sum of it and you would look at this and say, okay, what do I have complete ownership of? You have the complete ownership of this wealth? Great. You, is this wealth above the nisab? Check. Have I had this for over a year? Check. Then you pay zakat on it. If any one of those conditions are not met, you don't pay zakat on it. Wallahu uh, alam. Let's look at um, a, a, a frequently asked question, which is about um, about uh, how how do we calculate zakat? Like how do we figure out that final number? Right. Uh, well, you take your zakatable assets, and those are again cash, gold, silver, uh, business, you know, inventory, commodities that you are selling. Um, that you take them, uh, also, sorry, your investments like stocks that are like cash, you take these things, you get the valuation of it. What is the valuation of it? Minus a deductible. The deductible here, do not think of it as taxes. Think of it as uh, money that you have borrowed from people, money that you owe people. That's not your money, right? That's something you could say, I don't, it's not my wealth. I will deduct it from my zakat wealth and then you finally have your net assets that when you have that final figure uh that is what you pay zakat on 2.5 percent of it it's a slightly you know m maybe this slide should have been afterwards but let's let's take a look here first right let's talk about debts first i'm going to revisit that slide because uh, i think perhaps after reading this it would make a little bit more sense okay uh, as i mentioned if you owe some if you have loaned someone money that is your money. They have it. Your money, you will pay the zakat on it. Okay? But if you're the person who's borrowing, the money you have borrowed is not your money. Okay? That is someone else's money. And thus, you will not be liable to pay zakat on that money that you have borrowed from someone. Okay? Now, in, in modern times, we deal with uh, loan obligations, debt obligations that are not just, you know, small amounts or small uh, time frames. We have very large timelines for debt obligations and if you were to take this principle of oh i don't pay zakat and what i don't uh what, what i have borrowed if you take that and apply it you know in a very simplistic manner then uh, a lot of people who have mortgages or long-term debt obligations will say oh you know what i i won't have to pay any zakat for most of my life that is contrary to the spirit of the sharia and actually also contrary to the letter of the law as well because that's not what the letter of the law is stating okay it's talking about your money that's not yours. You don't pay zakat. That's the letter of the law. Now, how do we map the two? How do we take this long-term debt obligation and how do we uh, bring it and uh, reconcile with this concept that we have here? The way we go about this is as follows. We look at the 
term of the debt. If the term of the debt is a lunar year or shorter, right? 12 months or shorter, then that be considered to be a short-term debt. And if it is greater than a lunar year, you would consider it to be a long-term debt, okay? That means that if you have a short-term debt, let's take the example of a short-term debt. You have, say, you owe someone $5,000 by uh, by the end of this year, right? By the end of 2024. That's a, a short-term debt because it is within the lunar year, right? It's, you know, within the Gregorian year and uh, lunar year is a little bit shorter, like 11 days shorter than the Gregorian year, okay? So now you take that and you say, you know what? This $5,000 that I owe this person, it's not my money. I will not pay zakat on it. Thus, what I would do is as follows. I will take my uh, cash in my checking account. I will take my gold and silver. I'll take the stocks that I can liquidate. I will sum them all, right? And say that sum comes out to $20,000. That's my zakatable assets. I will de deduct from it 5,000 that I owe this person, okay? That will come out to uh, 15,000 net zakatable assets. That is above the nisab because the nisab is how much? 8,000 and change, right? So that is above the nisab. If I have held that money for a year or I've had that money for a year, I would take 2.5% of it and pay zakat on it. And what would that be? For every 10,000 is 250, right? So for 15, it would be $375. That would be my zakat. In the example of where I have 20,000 dollars worth of assets, cash, gold, silver, stocks that I can liquidate. And I have a $5,000 loan that is due at the end of this year, right? So 10, 20 minus five, give me 15, and then 2.5% is my zakat. This is how the zakat calculation works. Now, let's look at a long-term debt obligation. Long-term debt obligation is like a mortgage or something, okay? Uh, you look at your principal. Not the interest. Ideally, we shouldn't have any interest that we're paying anyway. But unfortunately, this is not a reality for many people. Uh, so you take the principal only. And you look at the principal and you multiply it by 12. That gives you your long-term debt obligation mapped to the short one lunar year. To the current lunar year. And that is what you would say. That is the money that I don't possess and that is the money that I will not pay zakat on, okay? So in this example here, a person has $16,000 in assets, uh, you know, cash, gold, silver, uh, stocks that are liquid. All of that is $16,000, fantastic, okay? And they're paying uh, a monthly, uh, you know, payment of $550. Uh, 50 $50 is interest and 500 is the principal. MashaAllah, what kind of deal? Well, that's a great deal that they got here. <laughs> uh, Maybe not so great because they're paying interest, but still they're paying very little. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, 500 times 12 is 6,000. That is the amount. Again, the deductible is, a, I don't particularly, I'm not fond of this word. That's the money that you don't own. That's the, from your 16, that six is not yours. That is what you owe someone else. So that is why you re remove it from your 16, uh, subtract it from the 16, your net assets, left with 10,000, and that is what you will pay zakat on. This is the uh, idea in a simplified manner, right? Now, mortgages, uh, there are some ulama that say that, you know, you don't deduct your mortgage liability. Uh, and the reasoning perhaps here is that uh, a mortgage liability is, uh, you know, that, that money that you have uh, borrowed, uh, that money actually has gone into your residence, your residence, you're living in it. In many ways, it's like you're paying rent, a person who's paying rent and a person who's paying a mortgage in many ways are in a, you know, from a cash flow perspective are in a similar boat. So they're paying that loan or they're paying that rent to live in a, a place that uh, they call home. And, and so that's why some of them say that don't deduct your mortgage uh, and, and whatnot, but it is at the end of the day up to you. You are free to choose and you're free to say, you know what? No, this is a debt obligation. I will take the year's worth of the debt obligation. And I would say, this is money I don't own, I don't have, and I will not then pay zakat on it. And that is also fine. Wallahu uh, Zakat anniversary date. Uh, th this, I think, is perhaps, you know, uh, I think a little uh, 
needlessly complicated, but the simplif the simplification of it is as follows. The cat anniversary date is you pick a date. Pick a date from uh, your, uh, your Hijri year because, again, you have so much fluctuation and balances. You don't have one, uh, you know, you don't track every, every uh, asset that you attain on a day-by-day uh, -day basis, right? You don't track every paycheck, right? You don't track, I have had this paycheck for how long? I've had this paycheck for how long? I've had this paycheck for how long? We don't do this stuff, right? We just have one bank account, generally speaking. So to simplify matters, let's take one Hijri date, ideally in Ramadan, because Ramadan is the Hijri part of the Hijri calendar that you will not forget, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and for on that date, you pay zakat on your assets, and inshallah, that is khair, and inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you on that. Uh, let's see if there's any questions on the concept of... Um, on on uh the concept of um the the zakat date uh the not, zakat liabilities or and whatnot yeah the I, calculation. I think, yeah not 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 specifically on the calculation it's just uh, like I said right now the questions are still about investments like RFPs uh, like R RSPs and uh, mm. um, stocks and things like that so I guess when you get into that you could just go mm. go to this and then we'll we'll pause and to, Look those Perfect. So, like, like I on shares and investments. Let's dive right into it. Uh, we only have about twenty-seven minutes. I'm going to make this. Uh, let's try to get to the end of it, inshallah. I still have a little bit of time for some open QA. Uh, short-term investment uh, or long-term investment. Let's again go back to the intention of the investor. If the investor thinks of themselves as a short-term investor, right? This is the intention is to hold for less than the lunar year. Uh, then the entire value of the person's portfolio you will pay the cat on. And if they consider themselves to be a uh, long-term investor, right? And this is someone who uh, wants to hold that position for more than a lunar year, then they would use the uh, zakat asset ratio formula, okay? So let me, uh, you know, this is the zakat asset ratio formula uh, and to be honest with you, I have a better idea for you all. <laughs> I will. Uh, can you see my screen? No, right? Yeah, yeah. We can still see your screen. I can see it. Oh, no, no. oh you can see the, the Zoom, right? Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So you go on uh, Zoya Zakat Calculator, right? Uh, Zoya Finance is a uh, an excellent company for uh, screening uh, Sharia compliance of uh, stocks. Okay. Uh, that's what they're like. That's what this company does. But they also created this free. Calculator to calculate the account of stocks and funds, right? That's a very good tool. Really, honestly, it just makes things so much easier. I think it's just, you know, it takes all the headache out of the calculations. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's add a holding. What's a what's a good what's a favorite stock? Uh, to... uh, Google, I guess. Google, Alphabet. What is that symbol? No, it's still Google, I, right? I think yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's yeah, still yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, say, mashallah, you are a baller and you have a hundred Google uh, shares. You add that as a your your uh, as a holding, mashallah, as a passive uh, investment, right? Now check this out. This is the current price of the Google stock. This is the value of your holding. Okay, people. Now calculate. It says your zakat is thirty five dollars. How does that work? Plus 2.5%. What is 2.5% of, what was it? 15,394, right? 15,394 should be 384. So what gives? How come it says $35, okay? Well, the reason is you are a passive holder, right? You are a uh, holding this as a long-term asset, right? What you do is you take the current assets, the current assets, uh, and you divide that by the market cap. This can be found in like a, the, the financial uh, statement of a company, right? And that gives you the zakat ratio on what you owe zakat on. So you might be wondering why is this the case? I mean, and, and uh, I, there was another slide here before. I don't know why they took it out, right? <laughs> uh, but the idea here is as follows. You have a person, right? You are a, imagine you own a bakery, right? I mean, I'm going to uh, just 
the, the, ignore what's on the screen here for a second, right? Because the, the, this is a little bit, uh, it doesn't explain the concept as well, right? Imagine you are a, uh, you are a baker, yes? Uh, or you have a pizza shop, right? Mashallah. Uh, as a business, assuming, you know, like that, that, this is a business that's running, right? How do you value your business uh, and how much do you pay zakat on it? What you would not pay zakat on is the fixed asset, the the oven, the counter, the chairs, the storefront, the property. None of that you would pay zakat on. You would pay zakat on the source materials, you know, the items you need to create your product and the product itself, right? That is the, the sum of it, uh, the value of it, the sales of it, that, and then the, the, the savings of those sales over the course of the year, that is what you will pay zakat on, okay? So now, how do you determine for a publicly traded company what percentage of the company is the oven and what percentage of it is the storefront, right? How do you determine the ratio? That is what this particular ratio is trying to tell us. If you do this division, right? If you do the division by um, uh, of total current assets by the market cap, that gives you an approximation of how much of a company is the furnace and the how much of it is the baked goods and the products. So that is why when you do the uh, passive calculation here, it comes out to $35.15. If I was to add another Google holding, let's try this, another Google holding, and another 100, 100 shares, but I'm here actually a short-term or active uh, participant here, right? Now let's look at calculator you would see my passive holding is 35, right? It is only a fraction, right? It is only a fraction of what the uh, active holding is. The active holding is valuing the whole amount. It is valuing the whole amount. Whereas the passive holding, the liable amount is only 14.05. Uh, what is that ratio? Let's see it. 14.05 divided by 15. They're 15, 3, 9, 4. So they're saying, according to this uh, formula, only 9.13% of Google is the flour and the pizza dough and the pizza. And the 91% of Google is the oven, the storefront, the tables, the chairs, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the formula is calculating. That is why you have this. So you can take this uh, resource. Uh, it's an excellent resource and you can uh, utilize it. You can even use it to calculate, uh, you know, ETFs. ETFs have a whole host of, um, can you add ETFs here? I thought you could. Yeah, you can. There we go. Uh, ETFs are uh, a whole host of stocks in one uh, basket, right? So you, you can even do that and say, say I have 100 uh, shares of uh, SPUS. This is the SP funds, uh, um, S&P 500 uh, mi minus the uh, non-compliant companies, right? Uh, and that you can notice again that the zakat liable amount there is 385 out of that 37.58. Roughly around, let's see how much that is, 37. Eight five right, eight seven eight five, about ten percent, right? About ten percent there. That's what they're saying. So the idea here is that about ten percent of all of the companies in S and P five hundred Sharia exclusions ETF, okay, only that much is what you will owe the cat on, and 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 this is a alhamdulillah very nice thing to have. This is a very easy way, a very nice calculator that simplifies matters. I hope this makes sense, inshallah, for you all. Uh, the questions are on zakat calculations. I, I hope they have made, uh, they are answered now, right? How do you, someone says, yeah, talks, what's your how do I know one year has passed? You just basically, it, it's it's an it, it's your intention of how you are. It's not the stocks are fluctuating. The value of the stock will change every day. It's how long you've held it. That's the answer there. How long you have held it, or how long you're planning to hold it, that is what determines whether it's short-term or long-term. I hope that made sense, inshallah.
Uh, any what, what other questions are here about? Uh, yeah, there was the, the one on the uh, market cap Zoe uses, and yeah, the question on is it based on the day you're using the calculator, or is it based on a financial statement that was published, or other when when it was published? Great question. Let's see what how they do it. Methodology, right? Uh, they take the shares owned divide by the outstanding shares, and. A recursive application of this calculation onto the holdings, the weighted aggregation at the end. Uh, okay, so they don't specify it. Uh, whoever asked the question is a great question. I would encourage you to reach out to the Zoya people and ask them. Uh, I've asked them like some questions on their Twitter, right? Like uh, they're pretty good. They respond pretty fast. So you can ask them, like you know, how frequently do you do this? But even if they were to peg it from like the previous financial statement, like the last published one, that's still acceptable establishment. It doesn't have to be like the most current, like of the day. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, the other one was um, that uh, somebody had asked about RSP being converted to RIF, which is. We'll come to that. Yeah, we'll okay. come to that, inshallah. Okay. okay. So this was the cal calculation. I just, I, just to make things a little simpler and to make the example more holistic, uh, I wanted to just use the calculator and show that to you all. So I hope that made sense. And again, this is a. Uh, you know, a, a few years ago before Zoya, the tool existed, I I would, you know, open a spreadsheet and I would do these calculations manually to show people the differences. But now, alhamdulillah, we have this calculator. Alhamdulillah, it has saved us about half an hour of time. <laughs> alhamdulillah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Okay, so um, there's a question on, on Bitcoin and some of these cryptocurrencies. Um, do they, how do you treat them? Do you treat them in the same bucket? Uh, Bitcoin and uh, any type of crypto, you treat it like cash. Okay. Yeah, they treat it exactly like cash, inshallah. Um, RESP, Registered Education Saving Plan. That's what RESP, RESP stands for. RESPs are opened by a parent or guardian or, uh, you know, a relative uh, for the ch children uh, that is intended for them to go to post-secondary education. That fund, those funds are meant to be used for post-secondary education. Uh, and the government incentivizes this by uh, matching a particular amount, a particular portion of those contributions up to a certain limit. And then the children, when they reach a certain age or, and have attained uh, enrollment status in a post-secondary education, uh, post-secondary institution, excuse me, then they are uh, you know, eligible to withdraw that money uh, for uh, for whatever they want. It's not, it doesn't go to the university necessarily, but the idea is that they would use it to pay their university fees, okay? That is a brass tax of RESP. Of course, there's a lot of details that uh, I'm not an expert on. You can, you know, Google this or ask your financial advisor, but this is just a basic overview of what RESPs are. The key thing is the RESPs uh, have government grants, contributions that the government has put forth uh, and this is something that uh, is the entirety, uh, really the entire reason why you have this count is the government grant. If there was no government grant, you would have no incentive to keep money in this account because this is after tax money. You've already paid taxes on it. You don't get a tax rebate or anything else. The only reason why you do it is because of the government contribution. Now, technically, you can liquidate the RESP uh, entirely. If you were to liquidate it entirely, uh, you would lose the entirety of the government contributions. If you were to say, I'm going to liquidate it and withdraw it, the government will take all their money back. Okay, So uh, let's not assume there's no growth because that would be terrible, right? <laughs> if you have an investment account that's not growing, that's a very, it's a very sad situation. Uh, let's assume that there is a, uh, you, you, you can calculate how much of your investment account is your contribution. The ratio of the account is your contribution versus the government contribution. Say it is, uh, you know, in this case, it looks like five to one, right? So $12,000, five to one is the ratio. $5 that you put, the government put $1, right? This is actually pretty easy to calculate. You can run a report on Quest Trade or something and it'll give you that number, okay? Uh, you take then your entirety of the RESP portfolio and whatever the ratio is, right? Whatever that ratio is, five to one, right? So for every uh, for, for every six dollars, five is yours and one is the government, right? You would take the five, 
and you will pay zakat on that one, right? So uh, maybe five to one is a tougher example. Let's do four to one just to make things simpler, right? For every five dollars, four is mine and one is the government's. Okay. If I have ten thousand uh, dollars in, uh, so if I have um, in this case twelve thousand dollars in my uh, RESP account, okay. Uh, I will pay. I will look at uh, eighty percent of that again. Going by that four to one, four out of five ratio. 80% of that, and I will pay zakat on 80% of the value, including the growth, okay? Including the growth. Maybe let's do like uh, some different numbers because the numbers are uh, quite, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's bust out another slide here, okay? Uh, so um, say you have, wait, 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 let me find like a, something to scribble on. <laughs> okay, can you see the notes? Yes, you can, right? Okay, great. Oh, you're seeing my passwords. Please don't look at them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's not my password. <laughs> it's something I was doing for the school. Okay. Uh, so RESP example. Let's take a simplified example. Okay. So you your the the ratio of the ratio of money that you contributed uh, to the government the government contribution, right? This you can find out. So you can find out from your broker, you can find out from, uh, actually CRA publishes it, like how much they would match, right, accordingly. So you take that ratio. The ratio say is, for the sake of simplification is four is to one, right? So that means that for every, for every $4, you contribute, the government will contribute how much? People tell me. What dollar? <laughs> One dollar, right? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So for 400, it will be 100, right? For 4,000 and so on and so forth, right? So this is the idea of that amount that the government will contribute. Now you can take this and you can say, you know, for... Uh, if my child has now, let's take the example. Let's let's take this to its logical conclusion, right? Forty thousand. That will be ten thousand from the government. Okay. Now, say my child's uh, account has uh, ten thousand dollars. That's current value right now of the RESP account is valued at $10,000, including including uh, growth, right? Hopefully growth, not uh, de de depreciation, okay? You look at this, 80% of this is your contribution. 20% of this is the government contribution. How so? Because we have this ratio, right? Four is to one, right? For every 400, you, you put the government puts 100. So 80% of the value of this is yours, including the growth. So you take 10,000 times it by 80%, uh, that's 0.8. What does that come out to? That's an easier, that's an easy calculation, $8,000. That is the amount in the RESP that is your contribution. And because of your contribution, it got to that point. Even if you put like less than 8,000, right? The growth happened, alhamdulillah, great. But that growth was because of your contribution. That 8,000 you take and you say, you know what? I will pay zakat on the $8,000 uh, times 0. 0.025, which comes out to what? Uh, 25 times 8 is how much? Uh, $200, right? 200 Is that right? Yeah. That would be the zakat on the RSP. The value of the account is 10,000, okay? And again, these are round, rounded, well, rounded numbers. And you are putting $4 and the government is putting $1, right? So 80% of the contributions are yours. So you take 80% of the value of the RSP and that is the amount that you have contributed and through your contribution, it has grown. And that's the one that you will pay zakat on. I hope this made sense, inshallah.
people ask you questions for RUSP now? <laughs> um, so far, there are none in the questions. Um, so. Oh, I hope that means that they understand. I hope it doesn't that, mean that. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's assume. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I mean, I mean, they, okay. can some, they can put some questions in afterwards if it comes to mind, and we'll try and get to them, inshallah. Sweet. Okay. Let's get to RRSP, Register Retirement Saving Plan. Uh, RSP, you put money in, the government gives you a tax break. And when you take money out, they tax you on that money that you withdraw. This is the key part. The money you withdraw, you are taxed on it. So uh, that withholding tax, uh, uh, should be deducted when you are calculating the value of your RRSP holdings. Okay, so uh, let me just see here. Yes, uh, the way we would uh, the, the, there's generally two types of RSPs. There's a self-directed RSP and then there's a group RSP. Uh, self-directed, you have access to it entirely. Uh, you can liquidate it, but if you liquidate it, you're going to have a big tax hit. Okay? Group RSP, generally, your company uh, administers it, and you don't have uh, the ability to liquidate it in the moment. Okay, Assuming this is true, because again, there's quite a bit of differences. The idea is as follows. The, again, what's the principle? What's the principle? The principle is access. Can you access your money? And the answer is yes, you can access your money. Then you take whatever is the value of your RSP, subtract from it the withholding tax. That would be up to 30% uh, for the RSP value. And then you pay zakat on what remains. Okay. Now, if your RSP is entirely stock uh, portfolio, mashallah, right? Like you have all these stocks in it, right? You can take the RSP value, subtract the withholding tax, and then you're left with, right? Like say with only taxes of 30%. So you're left with 70% of your RSP value is what you pay zakat on. Now you look at the holdings there and you are able to do the calculation from Zoya Financial, right? Or Zoya Finance. You can take your calculation and you can do the same things. Your holdings in your RSP, you can add them one by one and it will tell you the total zakat due on it. You take that amount 70% of it, you take it because the other 30% will be gone in taxes the moment you liquidate. Uh, so in this case, say this is my RSP holding, right? Assume this is my RSP, right? 429 is due if I could get all of it out liquidated. But I can't. If I was to liquidate all of it, if I was to liquidate my 200 Google shares and my 100 uh, SPUS shares, I will not get... I will not get this total value. I will not get thirty-three dollars or $34,000. I will get this total value times 70%. I will lose 30% in taxes immediately. So my zakat will be this figure, 429, 429 times uh, 0.7. That will be the withholding tax. That leaves me with $300 uh, dollars and change. And that is the zakat that I pay if this is my current holdings in my RRSP. Again, the key here, brothers and sisters, is because I cannot with I cannot withdraw all of them and uh, not suffer taxes or tax uh, a tax hit. So I have to factor that in here in my calculation. Uh, is there a question about RRSP? Uh, there's RRIF. Let's come to that in a second, inshallah. Uh, but this is the basic principle of how RRSPs work with Allah. Uh, registered Retirement Income Fund, RRIF, this is what happens when the person's RRSP are converted to RRIF, uh, and now they're forced to start to withdraw from it, uh, I think when you turn 71 or something, right? Uh, that is the amount, uh, and so instead of paying zakat on the whole value of the RRIF, we would take uh, whatever you're withdrawing from your RRIF, and on that, you pay zakat, right? And the idea here is that you consider your RRIF like a house that you pay zakat, like a house, excuse me, that's earning you rental income. That's the idea there. Because if you were to pay on the entirety of the RRIF or any entirety of any portfolio that you're living off of, then that's a very substantial tax hit. Imagine that if your 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 fund is 500k and you uh, 
uh, pay zakat on the entire thing, you're paying eight thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. That's a lot of zakat. That's you know twenty five percent of what you're withdrawing for for living expenses in this case. But you want to make it simplified. We want to make it fair. Uh, you would only pay zakat on the amount that you have withdrawn, uh, as if it's like a rental income coming to you from your from a house that you own. Inshallah, I hope this made sense for the person who has RRIF. They said that uh, my RRIF, which is my source of income, perfect. This is exactly the question. Do I pay zakat on the total amount, or I, I receive annually uh, from my RRIF? Exactly the question here. You only pay zakat on the annual income from your RRIF, not the value of the entire RRIF. That would be uh, punitive, and that would be very. Uh, you you would be overpaying by a significant amount. Wallahualam. Let's look at uh gold and silver. How many? We only have a few minutes left, so I will. Uh, I I will. Let's um, uh, we'll talk about gold and silver, and then uh, maybe we'll you know talk about uh business assets and whatnot, right? Like business accounts, uh, and and we will leave. Uh, we'll just touch on pensions quickly because pensions are. Uh, mentioned here as well, right? Uh, let's look at uh, gold and silver jewelry. You have uh, opinion one, uh, zakat is not paid, paid on jewelry. But before opinion one, the gold that you buy for the purposes of investment, for the purposes of holding it as a, uh, you know, as a, as a measure of value, right? For the purposes of having gold when the world collapses so you can <laughs> transact uh, whatever your intention is, mashallah. <laughs> uh, that you pay zakat on one hundred percent, without any difference of opinion. It's only jewelry that has a difference of opinion. And ma yulba the ulama, the jumhur, uh, the shafi'i, the Malikis, the Hanbalis, they say ma yulba what a woman wears frequently or habitually. Sorry, the correct word is aadatan habitually out of habit. There is no zakat to be paid on that because that is like the clothes of the woman. Okay, and clothing generally have clothing doesn't have any zakat. Uh, that is the uh, position of the jumhur, the majority of the ulama, majority in the sense of the majority of the mazahib. Uh, the Hanafi position is zakat is paid on gold and silver from jewelry, irrespective of whether it's worn habitually or not worn habitually. That is not factored in and uh alam, both opinions are equally strong you are free to take whichever opinion you want and the nzf uh stance and the nzf uh, recommendation is to take the uh, zakat uh, on the jewelry and to pay it on the jewelry now you can uh oftentimes jewelry is a mixture of metals and and precious uh, stones there's no zakat on precious stones like diamonds or anything else there's no zakat on other types of metals that may be considered precious only zakat is due on gold and silver so you can go and either yourself value it somehow if you have that information or go to a jeweler once and get the valuation of it and based on that you pay zakat on that gold uh, and whatnot okay so that is the uh, idea behind gold and silver uh, properties again. Uh, I I don't like the wording here. The property, the correct wording is there's no zakat on properties by default. By default, there is no zakat on property. If I wake you up in the middle of the night and ask you what is zakat on properties, your answer should be no zakat on property. The only time zakat is due on properties is if you are treating a property like a business commodity. Every time else, there is no zakat. The house you live in, no zakat. The house you own for renting. No zakat. Your Airbnb, mashallah, if you have a Airbnb, no zakat. Land that you have back home, you don't know what you're going to do with it, no zakat until you make up your mind. If you are a house flipper, you buy a house, you flip it, and you sell it, uh, that is when you pay zakat on the value of the house because now that house is like a business commodity. It's like the pizza that uh, the baker is selling. Yes? That is when it becomes uh, zakatable. Otherwise, by default, it is not walawad. Let's look at uh, pensions. Uh, pensions, there's quite a bit of detail. To be honest, pensions is not my strong suit. I don't know all of the 
different types of pensions here, okay? I will defer this, uh, if you have questions about pensions, I will defer this to Brother Zaid and the end of team because they have, mashallah, uh, good insights on this. But the idea, and I'll just share with you the principle of it. The idea is that the pension must be either accessible or controllable or both. If uh, it is neither accessible nor controllable, then you don't pay zakat on it. And the best example of that is, is a, um, a CPP, right? You don't have access to it. You don't have any control over it. So you don't pay zakat on it. But other types of pensions where you do have access or you do have some level of control, you would then be liable to pay zakat on it. And I would uh, just recommend that you uh, forward your questions and queries about it to the NZF team because they have a, a good amount of information on this. I personally... I'm not so well versed on it. Uh, though, unfortunately, I will not be able to uh, give you the details of it, unlike some of the other parts uh, of the of the presentation. Important slide to conclude, which is missed zakat from previous years. Uh, failure to pay zakat without a valid reason is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you must make tawbah and you must pay the zakat uh, that is due. Uh, and here are the steps to managing that Ms. Zakat. It is to identify the payment years and determine uh, the uh, nisab for each year, determine the assets in the years. Uh, you have to go back and basically calculate year by year and uh, and then pay Zakat uh, on that. And if it's too much, you can uh, overestimate a certain amount. You can you know be safer and pay Zakat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept. But the idea is that you try to do it uh, on a yearly basis without uh, without uh, coming into the situation. Wallahu alam. Um, we will, uh, I'll let the la last slide of the Asif can elaborate upon it further. But before that, the question is about business assets. I'll answer that question and inshallah we can uh, wrap it up. The particular idea of a business is uh, if you have a business, you have a business bank account, you do your business taxes separately. Then you treat your business as if it's like a, as if it's like a child in your, and you're the guardian of that child. Okay, meaning your personal zakat you do personal, by yourself, and then your business zakat, you would do it separately. You don't have two different nisabs. It's not like oh, I have a nisab for my business, and I have a nisab for myself. No, no, you still have one nisab for your all of your assets. You're separating the two for the sake really of taxes and whatnot. But you would. Uh, look at your business uh, as a separate entity, pay zakat on it. That's the easiest way to go about it uh, because uh, you keep the two separate uh, for all practical purposes. Uh, Wallahu alam. Jazakum ala khair, Arj, uh, for this. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this was extremely helpful and uh, helpful to those who attended. Just, uh, I'm sure that there are more burning questions and maybe there are questions that come to your mind after the fact. Um, what, what I encourage you to do is that you can reach out to National Zakat Foundation. Um, you can either use, uh, you got, oh. <laughs> so you can, you can use, you can contact us via email, um, you know, at zakat at nzfcanada.com. And you can book one-on-one -on -one consultations. And these are just free consultations. It might, who knows, maybe an Arj might even answer one of those questions in the consultation. Or, But we do have other Zakat advisors that uh, work on a one-to-one. -one. This, this is, you can book a 30-minute session. You know, it's a very specific uh, thing that you want to talk about or some general questions. These consultations are there for free. We do have uh, calculators on, on, the, on the National Zakat Foundation website as well that uh, you can access as well as lots of other resources, uh, print resources, frequently asked questions. Uh, there are some research papers and other kind of policy papers uh, on particular stances dealing with a various number of topics like pensions would definitely be one of them within the FAQs uh, that you could definitely look up online. So Jazakum al-Khair with that. With that, uh, inshallah, thank you everyone for attending uh, and then we'll, we'll close it right here. Jazakum al-Khair. Uh, oh, Sheikh Arish, could you close us out with a, a small dua as we are actually also kind of concluding Ramadan at the same time. For sure, for sure. Zakla Khan, Rabana Takabal Mina in the Kanta Sabina Limu to Balina in the Kanta Sabah Rahim, Anujala, Minal Mukhlasina, like all the makers of those who are sincere to you, uh, accept from us all that we have done. Allah Takabal Siamana, Wakiamana, Rukuana, Sujudana, Wazakatana, Wazadukana, Awaja, Wachim Bilbaki at the Sori Hati, Amalana, Wasalam Bina Mohammed, Wala Adi, Sabi Jain, Zakla Khan, and Shala, Salam Alekum Tala. Zakla Khair, but Salam Alekum.